WBBM FM, Chicago. The refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment presents for your listening enjoyment Edmund O'Brien as Johnny Dollar. This is Hamill. Did you call me? If your guy Hamill, the local coroner, I did. That's who I am. What do you want? I wondered when I could get together with you and talk over the Breer death. Breer? Which one was that? Neil Breer. He died last week. Oh, uh, what do you want to talk about him for? Funeral's all over. His folks have all gone home. I'm an investigator from his insurance company. They aren't convinced that he died a natural death. Huh? What do they think they know about it? They received a letter from someone here in town who said they weren't quite sure. What was that? Who was it? I'm sorry, I can't tell you that right now. But I'd like to go over the case with you. case is closed as far as I'm concerned. I'm busy with other work. All right, Mr. Howell. I'll have to start from someplace else. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So... Indoors, outdoors, at work or at play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Great Eastern Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Neil Breer matter. Expense account item one, $235, airfare and incidentals between Hartford and my destination. In compliance with the company's request, I will not make that city and its state a matter of this record. And I will leave it up to the company to strike the true names of the people involved. My first personal contact was the man whose letter had set off the investigation, Dr. Henry Richards. We met in his office secretly that evening after his nurse had gone home. Sorry to admit, Mr. Dollar, that there have been moments when I regretted writing that letter. I have a wife and a son and a practice to think about. This is a small town, and I could be banished for stirring up a lot of unnecessary trouble. Both the company and I understand, Dr. Richards, and we want you to know that your letter and everything you tell me will be kept in strict confidence if Neil Breer's death was due to natural causes. If it wasn't, of course, the letter and my report will do you no harm. Yes, I see. You have nothing to worry about. I'll be the villain. As a matter of fact, I think I am one already. I talked to your coroner. Hamill? You told him why you were here? Yes. The only way for me to handle this is to stay out in the open with him and everyone else. If I make a fool of myself, I'll take a late train out of town. You told him you received a letter? Yes, but not from whom. You're sure he doesn't suspect me? He didn't sound like he did. There's no reason for him to, is there? You issued the death certificate, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. Tell me about Breer. How old was he? He was 26. He was taken seriously ill at work. Where did he work? He was part owner of a service station. I was called there that morning. He was in a coma when I arrived, but Bircher described his convulsions to me. Bircher was his business partner? Yes, Wesley Bircher. He described the convulsions quite clearly. It sounded as though they were the result of a violent heart attack. I want you to understand, Mr. Dollar, a heart condition could have caused the symptoms he described and his condition when I got there. I called for an ambulance, but he was dead before it arrived. Do you know his medical history, Dr. Richards? Yes, yes, I do. He's been coming to me for a number of years. I was the attendant physician at the high school during his junior and senior years. He was a classmate of my son, Alan, and he and a number of the others continued to come to me, Bircher for one. Did Breer have trouble with his heart? Yes, there had been a condition, but it wasn't serious at his age. I told him that he'd have to be careful when he reached a certain age, but I was stunned at his death. I hesitated as long as I could before I signed the death certificate. But as I told you, if I'd refuse to sign it, I don't think it's fair to ask a private physician to take that responsibility. I don't either, but it seems to be the way we run things. What else might have caused his death, Doctor? Obviously a poison. Yes. Bismine. Uh, It's a metallic poison, isn't it? Yes. How fast does it work? 20 to 40 grains would be a fatal dose in from 10 to 30 minutes. And the symptoms could have been those described by this virtue? Yes, convulsion, coma, and death. Uh-huh. Breer is buried here in town? Yes. What are you going to do? 
I'm going to arrange for an autopsy. I don't know how you'll do that. Well, I'm going to ask you to play one more part in this, and then I won't involve you anymore. You haven't told anyone about the letter you wrote us. No, no, not even my family. All right. I'll come tomorrow morning when your nurse will be a witness. I'll demand that you show me Breer's medical history, and I'll go to the coroner and ask for an autopsy. I know I started it, but I don't like it now. Believe me, Doctor, you have nothing to worry about. And you wouldn't have started it if you didn't want to see the right thing done, true? Yes, yes. I'll see you in the morning. I made my appearance at the doctor's office the next morning, was unpleasantly efficient with his nurse, went through Breer's medical history, and proceeded to the coroner's office. The fact that he held that public office had nothing to do with Mr. Guy Hamill's personality. He was close to 50, and it had taken years to develop it. If he'd been a banker or anything else, I'm sure he would have been the same. I caught him as he came out of his office. I told you yesterday I was busy with other business. I know, but I hoped you might spare just a minute or two. Why didn't you call for an appointment? That's what I was doing yesterday when you told me you were too busy. Well, I am. Why don't you come back tomorrow sometime? It would be faster to go to the state police, Mr. Hamill. Well, why don't you do that, then? I want to play fair with you. I don't want to go over your head unless I have to. I'll keep you from your lunch only a minute or two. Well, all right. Come on. You've got a lot of nerve, you know, saying these things to me. Maybe you're right. But I'm being paid to say then, and a lot more. Right now, I'm going to ask you to have Breer's body exhumed, to have an autopsy performed. So, you're an investigator from an insurance company in Hartford. Well, I think it's time you brushed up on municipal law. As the coroner, I'm required by law to hold an inquest and order autopsy when there is reasonable grounds to suspect that the disease suffered a violent or unnatural death or died suddenly from some unknown cause. Yeah, that's a perfect quote. Neil Breer died as a result of a heart attack, and a competent doctor issued a signed death certificate to that effect. Do you have reasonable grounds? Yes, the letter I told you about. Reasonable. In effect, it said that Breer was young and healthy, and that there was a reasonable question about his dying of heart attack. Did this person presume to know as much about Breer as his doctor? As much, maybe. How familiar are you with poisons? Have you been trained to diagnose their symptoms and so on? No, I haven't. I rely on the attendant doctors to inform me. I'm not blaming you for that, but has it ever occurred to you that every practicing physician is not an expert toxicologist? The study of poisons is almost a science in itself. It's not my job to check up on the doctors that sign death certificates. And uh, what's this about poison? There is a poison that, while it's killing, gives the same symptoms as a heart attack. I'm adding that to the letter the insurance company received. To me, that adds up to reasonable grounds for suspicion. You know... I think your heart is in the right place. I don't go for this poppycock, but I can see how you'd get upset. It's not me. It's the insurance company that doesn't like even the possibility that murder or suicide can be committed and charged off to death by natural causes simply because a doctor signs a death certificate. Now, do I get my autopsy? The case is closed no matter what you say or think. It's the law. Do you think Bria survivors will feel the same way as father and widow? I don't know. You can go ahead. His survivors demand an autopsy, and I don't think they're fools enough to, then I'll accept that as reasonable suspicion, and I'll order an autopsy. That's good enough. And if you talk them into it, you're going to be held responsible as far as I'm concerned. Now, I'd like to eat my lunch, if you don't mind. I spent the rest of the day in the Hall of Records and in poring over old newspapers and a high school yearbook of Neil Breer's graduation. By that evening, I had a fair picture of the boy's background. He'd been a hard-working student, a good athlete. He'd eloped with a classmate, Paula Wilson, less than a month after they'd left school, and since then he had lived a completely average small-town life. There would be no reason for suspicion, except for the doctor's letter and his statement to me. So I kept that foremost in my mind, and after a 6.30 dinner, went to pay a call on Bria's widow, an attractive girl who turned an ashen gray when I told her why I'd come. Why? Why would anyone say such a thing? I don't know, Mrs. Breer, unless they had reason to believe it. Believe what? I don't understand. Why should anyone think Neil died from poison? I went to see Dr. Richards this morning. I demanded that he show me your husband's medical record. There was a heart condition, but it shouldn't have been fatal. Not at his age. Nobody told me. <laughs> Please leave me alone. I can't, Mrs. Breer. Not after coming this far and learning what I've learned. I can't stop until an autopsy is performed and I learn the truth. Whichever way it goes. No. It would be much easier for all of us, I think, if you'd help me. No, I won't. I can't stand it. 
You can't ask me to go through it all again. I'd hoped you'd want to know the truth yourself. I know the truth. Neil is dead. And there's nothing I can do about it. Nothing. Now leave me alone. Please go away. Leave me alone. Neil Greer's father ran a small grocery store with living quarters above. At first meeting, I hoped for more cooperation from him. He evidently had a calmer acceptance of death. You should have come to me first. I could have told you about Paula. Grief ain't honest after a person's dead. When a person's alive and suffering, then it's honest. But after a person's dead, you ain't really feeling grief for them. You're feeling it for yourself. I suppose you've got a point, Mr. Breer. I made up my mind to that after Neil's mother died. And some people think it's cruel, I suppose. But at a time like that, the big problem ain't dying, it's living on. Mr. Breer, after what I've told you, will you request an autopsy? No, no, I won't. Well, don't you want to be sure why your son died? I'm satisfied. He had heart trouble, we all knew it. I described a possible poison to you. There'd be no way for Neil to get it. Oh, I know about insurance, too. I don't like what's behind what you're saying, and I'm not going to take no part in bringing up things that are finished. What do you think is behind what I'm saying? I know about Neil's new insurance policy, and I know about suicide clauses. You think my son took his own life, and I tell you, he didn't. You're wrong, Mr. Breer. It would be stupid to infer anything like that, not knowing the cause of death. And that's all I want to know. What made your son die? I told you I'm satisfied how he died. He's beyond this world now, and I won't have him brought back. Good evening, sir. Hello. Key to room 312, please. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, you've had a couple of calls. The last one just a minute ago. Oh, thanks. No name left? Uh, no, sir. Well, who took the calls, please? I did. We don't have a regular phone operator. Oh, uh, this uh, gentleman, what did he say? Why, he asked for you. Uh, no, the first time he asked if you were registered here and had me ring your room. Then he called back a minute ago. He seemed awfully upset. Did you ask his name? Yes, but he said, never mind, I'll call back. Could you tell anything about the voice, like whether it was an old man or a young man? Uh, well, I I'd say it was young. Yes, young and almost hysterical. Yeah. Here's my card and ID. Well, yes, sir. When this man calls again, I want you to listen to the conversation. I'll get into trouble. No, you won't. Maybe over a legal matter, I'd like to have a witness. I can't pay for your help because paid witness is no good. Will you help me? If you're sure it's all right. It is. That's a promise. Thanks. I'll go right up to my room. More music in just a moment. But now I'd like to say this to the young women between the ages 18 to 34. If you've been wondering how you can help out in America's fight for freedom and liberty, investigate the many important jobs now open in the Women's Army Corps. It is again an important part of our team for defense. Get complete information at your local Army recruiting station. And now back to the music. Here's a request from a certain party over on Oak Street who signed her note, Restless. She wants to dedicate this... Johnny Dollar. You don't know who this is, Mr. Dollar, but you've got to listen to me. You've got to stop what you're doing and leave town. Why? Because there's no reason for you to be here. You're hurting people. You're trying to cause a lot of trouble that there's no reason for. You've got to stop. Who are you? It doesn't make any difference. You've got to stop, that's all. There's no reason for you to be here. The fact that you call like this and won't give me your name makes me wonder if there isn't more reason than I thought. You've got to stop. I don't want you to hurt these people. I'm warning you. Warning me? Yes, I'm warning you. If you don't stop... You're going to be hurt. Hello? Hello? Broke the connection, sir. That was the same man? Oh, yes, sir, it was. And you heard him warn me? I heard him all right. Good. Now, will you get me the home phone number of Coroner Guy Hamill? For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. 
So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, Mr. Hamill. Oh, yes. Come on in. Well, I suppose you feel perky this morning. Better than I felt yesterday afternoon, I can tell you that. And I suppose you've got it right. The toxicologist's on his way from the state capitol. The body will be ready for him and his helpers when they get here. I uh, hope you understand that I couldn't do anything but what I did. Sure, sure I do. All I have to go by is the death certificate. But something like that phone call to you comes up and then I can move. I suppose you never thought of it, but your position and that of a big share of the coroners in the country is pretty much the same as the position of the insurance companies. Hmm? Well, all they've got to go on is the certificate, too. Doctor signs one, the company meets the claim. Nobody will ever know how many poisonings have been chalked off to natural causes. Not because the doctor isn't sincere as a rule, but because he hasn't had the training to rate the responsibility of making the decision. Hmm. Well, it's 9.30. Those men from the Capitol should be here in an hour or less. I guess I'd better see that things are ready for them. You want to be on hand? No, thanks, Garner. I'll leave my name and number with the clerk if you'll have them phone me when they're through, huh? I boned up on it enough to know that a metallic poison such as bismine would leave traces in spite of embalming, where other types would be impossible to detect. I also knew approximately the tests and analyses they would have to make, and I didn't think it would take experts very long. It didn't. At 2 o'clock that afternoon, the results were phoned me. Hello, Dr. Richard speaking. This is Johnny Dollar, Doctor. Oh, oh yes. What is it? Well, you should feel proud of yourself, sir. Neil Breer's death was caused by bismine. What's that? An analysis was made? I didn't know anything about it. It was kept under cover. A man from the state capitol came over. They just finished. Well... And my instinct to write the letter was sound. Certainly was, and I hope you get the credit you deserve. Oh, no, no. But at least you and I can meet in public. How about dinner tonight? I'd like to, but I can't promise. Actually, this case has just started for me. Oh, of course, I should have thought of that. And I'm right back to you for help again. Yes, certainly. About the availability of bismine. Where could Bria have gotten a hold of some? Uh, very small amounts of it are used in the treatment of certain blood disorders. It's not a common drug by any means. I really don't know where a layman would get it. Okay. Uh, well, all right. Thanks, Doctor. Of course. Good luck. And call me if there's anything I can do. The inquest was not to be held until the following morning, but I asked for and got permission to start my investigation before the formal pronouncement of the jury. We all knew what it would be, death self-inflicted or by the hand of person or persons unknown. Sam's late to work today, but when he gets here, I'll send it right over. Yes, thank you. Hello, Mr. Breer. Well, Mr. Dollar, you did it, didn't you? Uh, I'm sorry, but at this point, I'm hardly the one to blame, am I? I blame you for tearing up our lives again. It was better before, no matter what. Sometimes ignorance is more merciful than knowing things. I'm afraid I can't agree with that. Well, don't make no difference. We know, and we'll have to take the things that come with it. You mentioned suicide yesterday, Mr. Breer. Did you have any reason other than being angry with insurance companies and me? Not no definite one. Nothing he told me. What reason, then? Neil and me weren't very close. Hadn't been for quite a time. I didn't like his marrying that girl the way he did, and he knew it. What do you mean, the way he did? Running off. Her barely the age of consent, and him not much older. I told them they was ashamed to tell their parents because they knew it wasn't decent. Haven't they been happy? I'm not sure either way. Neil didn't come home much, and he wouldn't tell me anyhow. But his business partner, young Wes Bircher, come to talk to me. Asked me what was ailing Neil. Said something was. He was down in the mouth all the time. And on the strength of that, you mentioned suicide to me, huh? Well, when I learned you was an insurance man after something, and then you talked about poison... That's when I figured you thought it was suicide on account of that new policy he took out. 
It isn't very much, is it? All right, Mr. Breer. I'll go down and talk to S. Burchard. Uh, what Mr. Breer is talking about? Oh, sure. I went out to see him. I dropped by the store and buy a pack of cigarettes once in a while. When did this happen about Neil, anyway? This thing about poison? Just today, they exhumed his body and made some tests. Good. I, I just can't believe it. And his dad talking about suicide. Nothing seems to make sense to me. And you don't think he was depressed about his marriage? Well, not depressed exactly. What then? What I said to his dad was that Neil didn't seem to be interested in anything anymore. We used to go hunting and fishing. He loved it. But the past year, maybe less, well, he just lost interest. But I never said it had anything to do with his marriage to Paula. That's what Mr. Breer told me. Well, he's wrong. I never talked to him about her, about their marriage, because I knew that he was just against it. What do you think was wrong with Neil? Well, I, I don't know now. After he died, I figured it was because he'd been sick. I felt terrible about how hard he worked around here and... Except that he never said anything about it, I was half blaming myself. But now, with the stuff about poison, I, I just don't know what to say. Well, you realize how serious this is now. If it wasn't suicide, Wes, it was murder. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? <laughs> Everything you told me, I, I just never thought about that. Was there something wrong with Neil's marriage? Well, I know it's tough, because to tell me, you have to talk about friends that you've known for a long time. But the truth has to come out. I'm not the only one that'll question you, Wes. Well, I, I, I don't mind talking. I don't think anything I say will mean anything. Everybody will tell you the same thing. There wasn't one person in our graduating class that thought Paul and Neil should have gotten married. Why? Well, because it was all so one-sided. Neil had chased her all through school, and Paula just sort of laughed at him. After they were married, they used to come over and spend the evening with my wife and me, and, well, even then you got the idea that it wasn't quite right. The only time Paula ever got interested was when we got talking about well, we were in school. Why did they get married, Wes? Well, Paula, and everybody knows this, Paula's strong-willed. And the guy that she really liked in school had to go to medical college. She didn't want him to go away, and well, when he told her he had to go, she just got sore. She threw herself at Neil, and they ran away and got married. And you think he knew that? Maybe not when he should have, but he must have found out. He never said anything. Like I said, he didn't seem depressed. More like he was always trying to, you know, get her to love him. Gosh, I don't know. Maybe he did do something. Maybe he finally gave up and... Who is this other guy? Is he still here in town? Yeah. Yeah, he's here for the summer. He's Al Richards. Alan Richards? Yeah. Doc Richards' son. They went together all through school, but she just told him that she wouldn't wait for him if he had to go away. She sounds spoiled, huh? Suppose you tell me what happened here the day Neil died. According to Bircher, nothing unusual had happened that day. They'd opened their place at 7.30. They hadn't worked unusually hard. They'd taken a break at about 9. And Neil Bree had been taken ill about 25 minutes later. And as I'd heard, he was dead not long after that. These people didn't fit into a picture of murder. None of the innocent ones had suspected it for a minute. But it was murder. I didn't have any proof of it when I left the service station, but I thought I had answers to a lot of questions. The solution was pathetically simple. Hello, Mrs. Breer. Afraid I'll have to bother you again. What do you want? Haven't you caused enough trouble? The trouble started before I came here. I come in? All right. They called me about the inquest. I told you yesterday that it would be easier if you'd help me get one. You didn't, so it had to be done without you. Now that I've learned your husband was murdered, there goes... Neil wasn't murdered. How do you know that? I... I know that no one would murder him. There'd be no reason to. How do you think he died? I don't know. If this story about poison is true, he must have taken it himself. Why do you think he would have done that? I don't know. I've talked to people. I know more about you and Neil than you think I do. All right. I didn't love him. He knew it. I could never love him. That's why he committed suicide? I don't know. You asked me why he would. We weren't happy. Why didn't you get a divorce? I wanted... I don't know. We, we didn't want to. There... 
only certain grounds in this state. You aren't cut out for this part, Mrs. Breer. What part? The quick answers. You're scared stiff. I am not. Why should I be? Didn't you start to say that you wanted a divorce and then you thought better of that? No, I didn't. What you meant is that he wouldn't give you a divorce no matter what you did, isn't no. it? No. No, that isn't what I meant. What then? What I said. What about Alan Richards? What about him? Neil wouldn't divorce you and you just had to get away from him. Isn't that right? I, I don't know what you're saying. Neil's heart. He said he... Why don't you tell me? You married him on impulse. You knew you shouldn't have. You talked to Alan. Yes, I have. What did he say? He called me last night to warn me to leave town. No, no, you talked to him today. He told you. You tell me your part of it. It's all lost, isn't it? You know, don't you? Yeah, I think I do. We couldn't help it. Al came home for Christmas vacation and it started all over again. I love him. I love him so. Sit down, Mrs. Breer. We couldn't help it. I wanted to get a divorce. Neil wouldn't. It was his fault, too. This was near Christmas? He told me he knew why I married him, and he'd never let me go. He told me I deserved it for doing what I did to him. I begged him. Did he know why you wanted to leave him? No, nobody knew. Everybody forgot about Alan and me. We were careful. But we knew we had to do something. Alan was studying to be a doctor like his father, wasn't he? Yes. It was my fault. I should have waited for him. He decided on the poison. <laughs> Oh, yes, it was all going to work. Neil's heart. No one would ever ask a question. But it was my fault. It was my fault. The rest of it I gave to the police. The fact that the uncommon poison was available to a medical student was administered by way of a vacuum bottle of coffee. After that, I left town. Expense account item two, miscellaneous, $86.70. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $556.70. Remarks? I hope the company will understand my not going back to Dr. Richards. A doctor in doubt about a death certificate calling on the interested insurance company for confidential help is a splendid idea. But in this case... The doctor's son was an accomplice to murder. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So, indoors, outdoors, at work or at play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint chewing gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gum. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Gum, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Ralph Moody, Edgar Barrier, Joe Duvall, Gene Bates, Mary Ship, Tony Barrett, and Peter Leeds. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at the same time when from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another adventure of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.